Um, so I wonder if um, I could just start with uh, Antonis and Jerry, your reflections perhaps on the first case. Um, Antonis, I know that you were involved in this. And so just considering our audience, um, it's very broad, uh, interdisciplinary. Are there any key reflections or, or take home points that you'd like to highlight for us? Yeah, thank you. Great case, Emma. Um, I don't remember the details of the case, but I remember that we were scratching our heads for some time there because this case actually very nicely demonstrates that it's not only that these conditions are relatively rare and therefore even if we group the patients together we don't get big data sets but within the group there will be patients with their own specific phenotype so it's so difficult really to you know learn from another case and and, and apply what you have learned to your patient that said the, the experience counts here is important. And I think the, the suggestion that maybe a defibrillator is not needed given the patient's stability, but also close monitoring is a good idea with, a, with an implantable de device is, is actually um, um, a suggestion that comes from the experience that these patients do die suddenly. But on the other hand, you can't, you know, in, implant defibrillators in, in all of the patients that you are unsure about because then, you know, the, 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 the benefit risk ratio is not necessarily in favor of the benefit. So uh, I think, yeah, that case um, teaches us that we need to look at the details, but also we need to be open minded and and think about alternatives uh, which will monitor the patient closely and um, hopefully keep them safe. John, Jerry, any thoughts from, from you? Oh, sorry, I'm going to carry on. Sorry, no, Jerry, you go first. Yeah, no, it's a great, great case, Emma. Thank you for presenting. I, I think for me, it just highlights where, where mitochondrial disease is difficult. That, that you know, that they're not syndromes that sit in a box. That they're, they're all different. The organs are all different. The presentation, the the risk is different. So, I, I, I see a lot of them, and I, I'm never quite sure how often to see them or how to risk stratify them because they're, they're all so different. So, so I think reveals are great. I think I have a really low threshold if I'm at all unsure to put a loop recorder in. It, you know, they don't have to keep coming out. They just put it by their bed, they present, and then you can just keep a slightly closer eye on them because because there is a risk of sudden death and it's really hard to stratify a lot of them. Um, so yeah, great case. And I think illustrated that beautifully, actually. Thank you. I I think this is it. You know, I, I spent a lot of time worrying about this patient because as I say sometimes they, you know, they do just die very suddenly. But I um I think as well now, you know, there's also consistency in time. So I followed him for over two years now. He came actually just the other week. And and actually when I stood back and looked at him, he I thought he's the best I've ever seen him. Um, you know, he has stayed really generally very well um, throughout this this period, which I know equally does not um, does not remove the risk entirely. I think certainly at one point I was very keen that he have a loop recorder, but he um, I mean, he's declined to any sort of interventional um, uh, management that we've suggested um, because of his MRI, for example, I really wanted to do a lumbar puncture. Um, as you know, these patients can have low folinic acid. He may have then benefited from treatment. He didn't want the lumbar puncture. He didn't want the muscle biopsy for diagnosis in the beginning. In a way, we were, you know, we were quite lucky that we got the diagnosis from blood. Um, but obviously, you know, I, I think he's he's very well informed. I think he does understand his risk. Um, but yeah, I I feel a little better having followed him for so long, but I still I still just worry, but but fingers crossed. And Emma, just picking up on that, the theme here that it, so many organs are involved at such complex set of disorders. One question that's come through um, separately is, is how should we be managing patients with these conditions and in what sort of setting? It's increasingly a move to digital or online delivery of care and patients potentially will end up in lots of different specialist clinics. What model do you use at St George's? What have you seen or heard of that works elsewhere? And what would you recommend in terms yeah. of care delivery? Yeah, so I sort of think of the holy trinity of neuromuscular disease as neurology, cardiology and respiratory. So all of my patients essentially go to those three specialties. So again, even if there are no cardiac symptoms, particularly if I'm not you know, particularly worried from that side, similarly with respiratory, they all get some form of baseline assessment and then that will determine to a certain degree how frequently we monitor them. Um, and we all 
share. So there, it's an it's an MDT service, if you like, even though they may be separate clinics. Obviously, for mitochondrial, then after that, it depends a bit on their individual um, which systems are involved. Obviously, diabetes or endocrine problems are very common. Um, I agree they often do end up in, in lots of different services, which I think I think is a big problem actually, particularly if those services are not communicating with each other. So obviously sometimes you, you do need a specialist who is in an, a different trust or a different place, and that's completely appropriate, but the information must be shared. I think that's really the key. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Ms. Jerry, your thoughts on that? So we, we're, we're having a conversation at the moment about how to, to look and redesign. Um, and for us that you know it's we need neurology we need diabetes you need audiology ophthalmology physio OTA. it's really hard we, and we decided that a single clinic that where we all had the different specialities was just too inefficient but but what i think does work well is having a, a mitochondrial mdt with everyone so you discuss the cases and then you know that you can have a sort of key clinician that leads and can take the advice from the others so they don't have to come up to multiple clinics there's, there's something to be said for having a um you know a, a south london odn mitochondrial mdt actually because that uh, because they are so tricky i wonder if that that could be something that comes out of this day actually um so i think a, an mdt and then they can you know try and limit the physical clinic visits and do some of the other stuff online i think probably I know what Antonis thinks. The direction towards towards multidisciplinary care is is will be official very soon, and every new document published, at least from the European side of cardiology, will um, suggest multidisciplinary care. So we we all recognise that the care, not just meetings, but the care of these patients should be, should be multidisciplinary. Now, how do we achieve that? It's it's another question and the logistics may not be as simple. However, I think all these patients need to have um, multidisciplinary care. And sometimes what we do is we, by setting up too many meetings, we end up attending only a small proportion of them. So I think we need to have a, a very sustainable actually way of looking after these patients, not just mitochondrial, but also Friedrichs and then myotonic and then, you know, name it. And, and there are so many conditions there. A, a system which will ensure that whoever needs to be involved will be involved in a timely fashion and will contribute to these patients management. So that's a big task. And uh, yeah, as you say, um, we, we are actually thinking about it, discussing about it, and hopefully we'll come up with something which will be in the best interest of the patients. Super, thank you. Um, I just encourage the audience, if you do have any questions for those brave souls who are still here, um, just as we're wrapping up, um, please do pop them into the chat. Um, our speakers, I'm sure, will be delighted to hear from you. Just another question for, for I think, all of you. Um, Jerry, you mentioned this a bit earlier in, in your talk, in that for a lot of these conditions, their primary other diagnosis, for example, would have been made first and then these patients are followed up for cardiac complications. Um, broadly, do you see that there's much scope to delay the onset of cardiac complications or the progression of disease? Or is it really just about vigilance of, of detection of the onset and then management appropriately? Essentially, can you modify the risk of developing cardiac complications? So I can make a start. I mean, I think the um, inherited metabolic diseases. I mean, if you manage the disease well, you, you definitely delay the, the the cardiac complications. But it's not it's not specific cardiac intervention. It, it's the it's often the diet and nutrition and supplements that. And if you if you do that well, you, you definitely delay the the onset and severity of disease. Uh, Mitochondrial is different. I think you, you just you're just looking to to pick up early disease and and intervene as you would with other patients. So, so I think they're, they're different for the two groups. Antonis and Emma, your experience with neuromuscular? Um, I, I think that's right. I think actually, you know, there's a lot to be said for, I mean, for many of the conditions in neuromuscular, there isn't a specific drug treatment, but um, 
there's a lot to be said for careful, supportive care. Um, so patients, you know, particularly from the respiratory side as well, because many of them will have respiratory muscle involvement. If you monitor them closely and if you intervene early um, to provide that supportive care, I think they do, you know, they definitely do better. And other things, as I said, you know, many of our patients will have high cholesterol. So, you know, managing that if they have diabetes, managing the diabetes well. Um, but I think it, exactly it, it sort of needs, there needs to be, I think, one service that does kind of have oversight of everything um, because otherwise they can become really quite siloed into different little clinics and the whole picture gets lost. Great and um, any final thoughts from, from Antonis and, and Jerry regarding the second case? Uh, I know a lot of those themes were, were touched upon and it was a really lovely illustration of, of your earlier talk in fact I think Jerry but um, anything you'd like our audience to remember in particular? Yeah, no, it was a great case, actually, Stella. I think you presented it really nicely. So, so it, there were many themes in it. So it's, you know, I think a lot of these disorders get missed. I mean, in, in most clinics, they'd probably still just be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, wouldn't it, or LVH. But, but there are a few, you know, it's picking up those red flags and there's, there's some very nice ESC papers out there with all the different red flags. So it's the it's the mild hypertrophy, it's the pre-excitation, supraventricular arrhythmias, the chronotropic incompetence, the age of presentations. It's absolutely classic case of PRK AG. So, so, so again, it's just I think for the audience, it's just thinking of those those red flags. And you know, I hope you know ha have a read through the the slides from today again and just make a note of the the red flags to think of. I think, but no, a great case. Thank you. No, that, I think that's all. That was the important thing. That even though the patient was feeling well, there are ma there were many things that we need to pay attention to and to correlate with each other, and then come up with a final diagnosis. And uh, that's what I really liked from that one. And also the fact that the initial doctor who saw the patient, the initial cardiologist, did the correlation. So he was referred because the doctor in the general cardiology thought about it and uh, took the case one step forward. Thank you. Super, thanks, Stella. Antonis, any reflections on that case? Uh, I agree with Jerry, actually. This is a great case uh, demonstrating the importance of the red flags. And combining this with the previous case, I think that working together, creating bigger data sets, we actually do something like manual artificial intelligence, if that makes any sense. In that, we have good data, big data, which will then um, can be used in order to spot the differences, spot the important points, spot the, those hints that will lead to the diagnosis. So um, we will, I'm sure we will create more red flags in the future as we will get to know these diseases better. But in order to do that, we need to have comprehensive and good quality data sets for clinical and research, research purposes. So it's very important for these diseases, as opposed as for all diseases, that we, we work together and and we you know break down the silos and actually join data sets so that we 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 have meaningful um, interpretation of of the data and i think that's that's very important for for the future super thank you so much um just before i hand over to Titi um to start the closing up any final thoughts from from our panelists um no okay well thank you very very much for just such a fantastic afternoon and your excellent contributions and um, we're very grateful um, so over to Titi to close uh, to close up thank you yeah I think we, we all can all agree we've had a, a fabulous day with lots of fantastic speakers so first of all I'd like to thank the audience for sticking with us um, but this, this time your contributions have been so fantastic and you know the, the sort of your participation all along the series has been great thank you to all the speakers um, who have contributed their time and expertise to give us all this core learning in, in, in ICCs, which I think looks like from all the cases presented is much needed um, across cardiology. And then, of course, I'd like to thank um, the course directors, uh, as this is the last um, uh, click session, um, Dr. Antonis, Antonis Pantazis, uh, Professor Elijah Baer, Dr. Lima Robert, and I think we can give Rachel, Dr. Rachel Bastian, the queen of click crown. Um, she's done an amazing job here. And of course, um, Andrea Marlowe and her team at the South London ODN, who
who have made everything run so smoothly and done all the sort of promotions and and all the logistics of this. So thank you very much, and uh, Andrea, to you and your team. Um, so uh, there will be a click part two, hopefully next year. And so watch out for that. Um, and thank you very much to all. I'm just going to hand over to Paz because she's going to tell you about important things such as Yes, uh, Sarah, I presume <laughs> a lot of you will want your attendance certificate and um, we ask just for a couple of things to do that. So look out for your inboxes, you will get an email uh, and in that will be a link to both feedback and also to the MCQ um, multiple choice questions uh, based on today. Once you've completed both of those things, you will then be sent your attendance certificate. Please remember that all the talks are available uh, on the website uh, below this link here. Um, so you can go back and review them. And again, keep an eye out on your emails for details about next year's uh, sessions. Thank you all so much. And it's been a pleasure to, to host. Thank you. Great evening. Bye bye. Bye. bye.